Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to City Christian Center, those online, and those of you that are here. We're glad that you are here this morning. And uh, we had a great day yesterday, and I'll, uh, I know there's going to be more talk about that later. But um, So before we get into the announcements, um, usually we dismiss the kids because sometimes Mel's announcements and stories get pretty long and boring. So I think, I think Pastor Brianna usually goes down and we pray for the kids, but I, I can't seem to find uh, Pastor Brianna. Is she back in the sound booth, uh, Allison? Is she back in the sound booth? Oh, there she is. There she is. Oh, oh, did you get released? Oh, okay. Okay, because we were worried about her. But yeah, so she wasn't looking so hot. She wasn't smiling yesterday. <laughs> Anyways, I invite the kids up that are going to go downstairs to Super Church. And uh, thank God we got uh, Pastor Brianna out of jail, and she's going <laughs> to, she, I can't help it, when you're bad, you just get disciplined. <laughs> we all love you, Pastor Brianna, just so you know. <laughs> and thanks for being a good sport. <laughs> so, okay, I'm going to pray over these, if that's all. Okay, I think I see one more, but she might be a little shy. We'll pray as she comes. Dear Lord, we thank you for each one of these children, these young people, Lord, that uh, are someday going to be uh, sitting in this pew, Lord, and having positions in this church and having positions in other church. Who knows? They might be pastors. They might be missionaries. They might be Sunday school teachers, whatever. But we believe, Lord, you're going to instill in their little hearts today your love and your word. I pray you just anoint the teachers and the leaders, Lord, as they go down, and Pastor Brianna, and you would just pr pray blessings over them right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, I'm trying to find the uh, announcements on the... Am I even on the right screen? There's another one over here, but... Okay. Okay. Oh, I can read pretty small, yeah. If I have to, I can zoom in. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay, that's good. It's a very good part of that. Okay, so um, uh, just a little reminder about missions. Um, you know, the baby bottles went out on Mother's Day, and we we're supposed to come back on Father's Day, but... Um, Pastor Ann Newell has given you a week's grace, so please bring them back today, or she'll be looking you up this week. Um, for the board members, there's a board meeting here at the church, 6.30 Thursday night. Guess I'll be missing my grandson's ball game. And this Friday, there's youth, and it will be um, the last youth of the summer, for the, before the summer. And uh, it says here, uh, grade six are welcome to attend uh, Friday here from seven till nine. Um, okay, so like I say, we had our family fun day yesterday. Don't know if you were all able to make it or not, but if you weren't, I'm sorry for you. But <laughs> anyways, um, where is Mark? Mark, I'm going to bring you up and you can maybe tell a story or so. While he's coming, I'm going to make one more announcement. The 11th annual Nine and Dine Golf Tournament for the Mess Studio. Um, is it over with? Oh, July. I was thinking June. Okay, yeah. So, yes. Yeah, so, it's July 23rd. I was thinking June 23rd, is it? <laughs> Maybe I should zoom in on this a little. Um, so, it's Sunday, July 23rd at 1.30 p.m. Rivendale Golf Club, 7359 Highway 38 in Verona, registration fees $95 per person. And if you just want to go for dinner, that's $40 per person. If you're interested, please see Pastor Steve or Miss Sandy Dodds. Mark, just a minute. <laughs> I don't think I have, oh yeah, no, you gotta give it back to me, I do have something else. Good morning. Just for those who don't know me, I'm uh, Mark, your friendly neighborhood custodian. Um, I'm the one that... <laughs> and uh, as Mel was saying yesterday, we had a great time and a great turnout, especially 
families and their kids from the neighborhood for our fun day here in the parks. And we do so also have some kids, or, or should I say uh, big kids, within big bodies here in our church. And as you hear, uh, Pastor is a new nickname. He's known as Mr. Sud Man. That's pretty scary. It's almost like the abominable snowman. <laughs> but also, during this time, we did have a police cruiser come, which, as you saw earlier, Pastor Brianna was taken away. We don't know the story or details. We'll leave that to her to tell. But we also had them come just in case, because we had to have a search party put out. We lost a friendly, lovable couple here in the suds, and we didn't know where they were, and we ended up finding Brian and Ann hiding in the suds. And I don't know, I'm not sure we have, we had pictures, but Brian and Ann got into the suds just as much as the kids and got lost. Well, not the sud suds, just the <laughs> soap suds. <laughs> Everything else was good. But I wanted to take this opportunity on a serious note. I'm not going to mention names because there was too many. But for everyone that's here that was here yesterday that came in early for setup, for those who work the stations and everything in the way of food, uh, crafts, tables, and then for everyone who stayed behind and uh, helped make yesterday a cleanup day that much more easier for myself. So I just wanted to say on behalf of myself, a big thank you. Okay, um, and we want to thank Mark because he's, uh, I went and did an errand after I left here and I know there were still quite a few people here after I left and uh, when I came back down Collins Bay Road, there was only one car left here and that was Mark's <laughs> and then he told me he was here like at seven or something this morning so he's doing a great job, we're really happy for him. Um, I'm just wondering, is, would anybody, uh, would there be anybody out there that would be disappointed if I didn't tell a story this morning? <laughs> Okay, I got one. So what I've noticed is these lights on the stage, they've been replaced in recent weeks or months because there used to be some out. So I got doing some research and figuring out what, what do other churches, you know, do. And so we just wanted to figure out how other churches handle when they have to change a light bulb. So the charismatics, it only takes one because their hands are always in the air. Now, the Pentecostals, and this must be the other Pentecostals, uh, it takes ten. One to change the bulb and nine to pray against the spirit of darkness. <laughs> and the Presbyterians, um, none. Lights will go on and off at predestined times. Uh, the Baptist, at least 15. One to change the light bulb and three committees to approve the change and decide who brings the potato salad and the fried chicken. <laughs> the Episcopalians or whatever, the, there's three of them. One to call the electrician, one to mix the drinks, and one to talk about how much better the old one was. <laughs> and then the Unitarians, um, they say, well, we choose not to make a statement either in favor of or against the need for a light bulb. However, if in your own journey you have found that light bulbs work for you, you are invited to write a poem or compose a modern dance about your light bulb for the next Sunday service in which we will explore a number of light bulb traditions, including in incandescent, fluorescent, three-way, long life, and tinted, all of which are equally valid paths to luminance. <clears throat> And then the Methodist, they're undetermined. Whether your light bulb is bright, dull, or completely out, you are loved. You can be a light bulb, or a turnip bulb, or a tulip bulb. <laughs> Bring a bulb of your choice to the Sunday lighting service and a covered dish to pass. <laughs> and the Nazarenes, uh, it would take six of them. One woman to replace the bulb while five men review the church lighting policy. <laughs> and, and the Lutherans, None. Uh, the Lutherans don't believe in change. <laughs> and the Amish, um, they don't even know what a light bulb is.
The views expressed of those who do announcements do not necessarily reflect those of the establishment of City Christian Center at this. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. <laughs> we have had such a great time this weekend from uh, Youth Friday night and then rolled right into uh, Saturday, as you've heard. We will have a bunch of pictures, but um, we just threw a few up there to begin with. But there were so many photos taken. And uh, again, we just had a great time. And some of the people that we had seen on our Easter egg hunt on Saturday, um, Back at Easter time, we're here because we handed out flyers at that time. So word's getting out. People are getting used to the fact that we're trying to make an impact in this community, let them know that we love them, that stuff is free, not always, but, you know, free chocolate eggs, free wagon rides, free Halloween candy, and free family fun day. And we've got some more great ideas. We're just going to keep adding to it. Next year already, we've lined up a dunk tank uh, for Pastor Brianna, not for me, just for <laughs> Pastor no, we actually ran one about eight years ago, and I did it. You know how cold hose water is? <laughs> anyway, I uh, also just want to acknowledge that uh, both Nat Deans and Nathaniel both have graduated high school and are free, so we want to congratulate them today. Way to go, guys. Awesome. And we pray a blessing on your future, guys. God's got his hand on you and is going to direct you where you're supposed to be. So, awesome. Congratulations. I don't think we have any people who are graduating grade 8 this year that I know of. Um, so I think we've got those two. And Paula Perillo just graduated Queens, I think, too. So awesome work. Yeah. I mean, I'm just glad that I got up in time to be here. For... Now, our volunteers yesterday, um, they've been wonderful. The only problem I have with them is that they do not know how to tell time. Because I said, well, I'm going to show up at 9. If you guys could come between 9.30 and 10, that would be great. 8.57, I pull into the parking lot. And there's already five people trying to get tents up and tables out. And I'm like, y'all just don't listen, do you? <laughs> but very blessed about not only the, the people, who, as Mark said, who helped out, but also the people who came. And we had community people just go, hey, we saw your sign. So we came. I'm like, yes, thank you. And no one stole our signs, which I was also very happy about. So uh, it's good. God is good. And you know what? I'll tell you, we're in a season right now. You may not see it, but... Um, People's lives are changing, faith is growing, people are being transformed. And so if that isn't you, I want you to know it's happening here. And uh, I can tell you, I don't tell names or all situations. I'm just saying that some pretty amazing things happening over the last few weeks. So we give God the glory. Amen. Amen. So this morning, my message is called Just a Hint. And, uh, and I want to talk about this idea of, of seeing God do something and all of a sudden we notice I remember being a youth pastor a long, 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 long time ago. Uh, and we went camping to this, it was like a volleyball tournament of youth groups at Port Burwell, way in western Ontario there. And we were going to sleep in tents. And just, I got to say, yesterday, we, we have to give thanks to the Lord too, because the forecast was rain, 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 thunder and lightning. And I, I had my car windshield wipers on from when I showed up that morning. And then all day, not a drop. When I got back in my car, I got the, ee, you know, because they had dried out. There was not a bit of rain while we were. And then, of course, you remember last night, right? <laughs> right? God was good. So on this youth retreat, we're headed to this volleyball tournament. And there's like going to be 50 different youth groups. And we're all bringing our A game. But we're going to sleep in tents. And it's pouring rain. Just like that. In fact, we had an old Mercury Lynx with an aftermarket sunroof that filled up the wheel wells in the back seat. So we had a couple of youth going, Pastor, are we almost there? You know? And so I said, you know, it's like, this is going to be horrible. Sending up a tent in this rain, we're going to be, all, all our stuff's going to be so just miserable. I said, well, why don't we just ask God to, to stop the rain for when we, when we get there? And he's like, we can do that? <laughs> like, well, we can ask. Like, come on. So we said, okay, Lord, uh, help us. Uh, we got to set up tents. It's in the dark already. Help us. Uh, just if you could hold up the rain for us, we'd really appreciate it because we're already dunking our feet in the back seat there, and um, we'd really like that. And so we get hit. We get there. We just kind of pulled in. It's still drizzly. All the trees are still dripping water, but it had stopped raining. And this young man, he, <laughs> he's incredulous. He's like, what? He's like, hey, it stopped raining. I, and so as a youth pastor, right, I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> we, we prayed, didn't we? Come on. And he was like, so we prayed for the rain to stop, and the rain stopped. I'm like, yeah. 
It doesn't always work out the way we want because he's a sovereign God. He decides when the wind blows and when the rain falls and all that. But we asked and he answered. And that grew that young man's faith because he tried to ask and it happened to work out the way he wanted. But it informed his faith. And I was thinking about this idea of actually rain that we really desperately needed because my grass kind of looked like Arizona in the front yard. And just seeing this idea of, of new life there's just this hint of God showing up and uh, this, imagining a little shoot breaking through the ground and break green against black rich soil, a picture of brand new beginnings. And how many of us need brand new beginnings sometimes? In fact, the longer, the older we get, the more we've been doing the same thing. We need re- times of refreshing and God offers those, it says in his word. So lately there have been a few people walking through new levels of faith and exploring all that God has for them and it's exciting to see new revelations, new commitments through their eyes. And uh, the scripture today is this idea of how God reveals himself, how he shows up. And now the scripture says the heavens declare the glory of God. If you look at the stars and the vastness of space and or you go to the great canyon, the Grand Canyon, or you look over the ocean, there's these great general revelations from God. But also there's times when he specifically shows up. He manifests his spirit. We know that God's moving. And this is in 1 Kings 19, there's this one of these situations. Elijah has just been through it, one of the greatest miracles, and yet also uh, one of the greatest challenges, and he is running for his life. And uh, in 1 Kings 19, I'll start at 11 and go past it. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. So Elijah's having an encounter with God. He's not where he's supposed to be. God's trying to direct him, get him where he should be, and he stands at the mouth of the cave, and here comes God. He says, and there was a great and strong wind that tore into the mountains, so not a breeze, like chunks of rock are falling off, and like hurricane season, right? He says, the wind tore into the mountains and broke rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in that wind. And then after the wind, there was a huge earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, it says, a still, small voice. Translated, that's actually a gentle whisper. This tiny, so Almighty God shows up in this tiny little way. And so it was when Elijah heard it, he he wrapped his face, covered his face with his mantle, and then he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And suddenly the voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And the rest of the story is basically he's saying, Elijah, I have plans for you. You're not in the right place. And so I'm going to show up. I'm going to speak to you. I'm going to encourage you to get to the right place. Get where you're supposed to be going. He goes, Elijah, what are you doing, man? I've got stuff for you to do. I've got plans for you. I've got, I want to bless you. I, I want to show you favor. I want to let you minister to other people. I want you to share the love I put in you to other people. And it was a gentle whisper. And in that slight, quiet moment, after all the noise, after all the big splash, God speaks right to him. And he had his attention. But all it took by the power of God was this still, small voice. Today we look at glimpses of God and understand the possibilities of seeing him in greater light, hopefully, this morning. Uh, The word says, Behold, I'll make all things new. Jesus said that in Revelations. He says, Unless a seed falls to the ground, right, and dies, it can't bring new life. There are times when we need to let go of other stuff so that we can get a glimpse of God. And that's something we're going to revisit this morning. And we need faith the size of a mustard seed, it says. And you've probably heard this a thousand times before. I'm going to say it again. A mustard seed is one of the smallest seeds to plant, and yet it's one of the biggest plants in the garden. That's why he used that analogy instead of some other plant or some other Mustard seed. Why a mustard seed? Some people don't even like mustard on their hot dogs, which next year we'll have more hot dogs, by the way. I'm just saying it was good. A lot of people. Mustard seed is tiny, but the plant is huge. And so they're saying, if you have just a little bit of faith that God could do something, imagine the size of what that could become. You start with a little bit of faith, and all of a sudden God does something incredible. That's the nature of that analogy. And then a cloud the size of a man's fist. There had been drought in the land for seven years. It hadn't rained. And God finally told the prophet, 
rain is coming. And he prayed and he prayed and prayed. It says the story is seven times. And on the seventh time, his servant goes out and checks. And he's, it's been totally dry. He's praying for a downpour. And he sees a cloud the size of a man's fist. God, that might be a hint of your presence, but it was not really what I asked for. I needed some Saturday, June 24th clouds from yesterday afternoon. You know, the dark black rolling ones. That's what I was kind of going for. That Not just a light sprinkle, but the, the rain that fell after our fun day. He's thinking, that's the kind of rain I'm asking for. And you send me a cloud the size of a man's fist. But you see, he understood. He had a hint, a glimpse of what God was about to do. He said, the promise is that Rain's coming. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to open the heavens. And when this small cloud showed up, he goes, this is it. I've seen a little bit of what God is about to do. But since I know who God is, that little bit is enough for me to know. He says, listen, get in your chariot and hurry before the driving rain stops you. From just a glimpse to this huge downpour. That's the idea I'm trying to get to you. When God reveals himself to you and to me, it might seem like it's a small thing. Like, well, I, I, you know, I've seen that on TV, on CGI and stuff. No, no. When you used to get a glimpse of what God might do, even supernaturally, all of a sudden, be ready because anything could happen. Now, do you believe that? Just say it loud with it. Anything could happen. Just say it with me. Anything. Now, in your mind, did you go, no, yeah, maybe, <laughs> or we'll see. <laughs> I can tell you that I have prayed for, in, in the number of years of my ministry, I've prayed for a ton of people. And I haven't always seen these beautiful signs and wonders, of, you know, big flash of light or anything. I prayed for a woman who had degenerative eye disease, went to the doctor, came back. The eye disease was gone. The, the pupils that were, were uh, slowly changing shape, she, they had the, what the eyes were supposed to look like, what her eyes looked like. She went back another week later, and then they took another set of pictures and said, this is what your eyes look like now doesn't look like this photo. It looks like this photo, the way they're supposed to look. Your eyes have been healed. Prayed for a young woman who had uh, cysts in her ovaries, found out they were cancerous. And she was a young nursing student. You've probably, some of you heard this story. She was engaged, wanted to have a family and kids, just destroyed. Like her life trajectory was just in pieces. Went to the doctors, had the tests again. She missed the one. We were doing cell group. This was at a small group. She missed the one week because she has just been away getting tests and all that and dealing with the, this new reality. And then she went back again and she came back all excited the next time. She said, they did tests and they kept me there forever. I'm like, that doesn't sound like something to celebrate. He said, well, well, they had to do the scan again. And they said, not only are they not cancerous, they said, we can't find those cysts anywhere anymore. They disappeared. God had healed her. I wish she could say that God healed every person I've ever prayed for with cancer. That's not happened. When they go to heaven, they get their ultimate healing, their new body. I'm talking about a move of God right here on this planet. It still happens. It happened in my lifetime, so not all that long ago. Seriously. Even this last year, people who were diagnosed with cancer in this very church who, had, do, who no longer have cancer, like the doctor's observing, they're watching, doesn't have it. Someone who was supposed to have surgery didn't end up having surgery. What? Like the surgeon actually said, well, you don't need to be here. Excuse me? <laughs> and, and we could say, oh, uh, let's try and explain what science or rationalize or whatever. You know what? Let's just take it for what it is. It's a hint. It's a glimpse. It's a, it's a, a little piece of what God is up to. The last few weeks, some people are saying, you know what? I, I need Jesus in my life. How do I do that officially? How do I just seal the deal? And they did it. The one person asked me, like, I'm supposed to ask people if they wanted to ask Jesus into their heart and get saved. He goes, um, could I do that? I'm like, yeah. He's like, could you help me do that? I'm like, yeah. He's like, could we do it now? Yes! <laughs> Let's not wait. Yes! <laughs> See, I'm the one who's supposed to convince and control, you know, this is really something you ought to do before you leave, you know. It's like a telephone telethon. Have you ever watched TV? We'll go back to your show after just 10 more callers, please. 10 more callers and then we'll return to your original. Y'all don't watch TV, do you? Or some of you just are watching Netflix or whatever. 
Uh, there, there used to be public television. They had to raise their funds. I didn't have to convince or twist his arm or, or explain it again. Or It was just a moment, a right time where God showed up. And it was amazing. And I don't know how excited they were, but I was sure excited. It's amazing when someone makes an eternal decision. What? It's that good. Glimpses of God revealing himself. Moses says, you've been telling me how to lead, try to lead these people, and they're fighting me. They're stiff-necked people. It's been difficult. He's like, if your presence doesn't come, go up with us, then don't send us up from here. And he's like, okay, I'll, I'll stick with you guys, even though you frustrate me. This is God say. And he goes, uh, now show me your glory. Like, Moses, you were doing okay when he promised he'd come with you. You're kind of pushing it, aren't you? And he says, no one can see the fullness of my goodness and live. So he, he puts Moses, stands out again on, from a, on a mountain. And he said, he'll put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll put my hand over you. And my goodness, all my goodness, the fullness of my presence will pass by. And, and Moses got a glimpse of what it was like to be in the presence of Almighty God. He went to the tent of meeting. And as he's praying, he leaves and the, the Holy Spirit ministering to him. And he comes out after being in the presence of God. He's literally glowing. In fact, he has to put a cloak over his face because people are watching him and they're freaking out. Like, that's not just a sunburn. Something's going on with this guy. Something supernatural. And so he had to cover his face when he went out from the people because God had done something profound and incredible. That's what God still does to this day. And there was a, a day, uh, now I think it's probably 20 years ago now, but a, a team from, I think it was Belleville, went to Mexico and they had a pot of chili or beans. I think it was, I think it was chili. And, and the lineup went forever. The whole village showed up to have this food that they were putting on for them that one night. And the one guy, it's funny because he's, no pun intended, a, be a bean counter. Like he owned his own business. He was good with numbers. He was, you know, could tell spatially and stuff. And he's just scooping and putting some food in each person's bowl. And he's like, God, you're going to have to multiply this food. There's no way we're feeding this whole crowd. And he just kept scooping and scooping. And finally, they, he could see the end of the line. And they're just scooping. They bring out the last pot. This is the last one. <laughs> Thanks for telling me, but don't say it too loudly because there's a whole people. And he just kept scooping. And finally, last few people. And he's kind of scraping at the corners now. Last person comes, last scoop of chili. A miracle of chili? Like, I'm a barbecuer. I wish it was like the last piece of steak, maybe. But <laughs> the point is, it happened in our lifetime. It happened like within the last 20 years. God is still performing miracles today. And I wish that all of world hunger was gone. I do. I wish all of cancer was healed just by one prayer. I do. I, I wish that, you know, wars would just stop happening right now because we could just say that and then, then it would be done. We live in a fallen, broken world. And we have a devil that wants to destroy us. And every day that's our reality. But even in that reality, having a relationship with Jesus Christ and seeing his love and feeling his peace and learning about his promises and learning how we can pray and fast and intercede and dig in for things, every once in a while, there's a hint of his glory. There's a hint of reality. There's something that happens and you're like, man, that is so good. It's so good. Like people showing up and, and all of a sudden money was there where it wasn't supposed to be. Or where health is there where it wasn't supposed to be. Or relationships that were supposed to be obliterated and torn apart are all of a sudden being restored. That's not supposed to happen. In fact, a lot of modern day counselors were like, well, if it's, if it's hard, then I've got a solution. Don't do it. Like just leave that person. And sometimes that, that, it comes to that. I'm not, sometimes there's no other way. But there's this idea of disposable. If it's not working for you right now in this moment, then you know, hey, psh, you know, anything that you don't feel cool about right now, you just separate it from yourself and then you'll be fine. If this hurts you, all you have to do is just stop doing that, right? I get it, except it's way too dimensional. Because there are people who have walked through valleys in their relationships and in their situations at work or in their family or whatever, where there has been a valley, it has been tough, and coming out the other side, there are miracles. I would say, don't trust me, ask someone else, but I'm not talking about other people. You won't know who I'm talking about. I'm just telling you 
that those things have happened. I've seen marriages restored. I've seen people and their kids restored. I've seen two brothers who didn't talk for decades all of a sudden talking in each other's lives again. Relationships restored. Because God shows up and you see just a little bit of his power. I should get back to preaching my notes here. God has only begun to reveal himself to those who seek him, but the promise is to those who seek him, they will find him. We have opportunities to be blown away by his revelation all the time, and yet there's so much more to God than we have encountered. I don't care how long you've been in church, how long you have believed in God, there is still more for the Lord to reveal to you until you get into heaven. There's more. Consider an iceberg, if you would. We only see 10% of an iceberg in the water. Why is that? I'm not a scientist, so I looked it up. Scientifically, it's because, and this is really simple, it's because ice's density is only nine-tenths of what water's is. 0.92 grams per milliliter compared to water, which is one, or salt water, which is 1.03. I'm so smart. Because I Googled it. That's why. So it's only slightly lighter than water itself. The point is not about the iceberg so much. It's just a fun fact. What I learned, though, is... That this idea of seeing an iceberg and going, wow, that's a lot of ice, and realizing that 90% of that is still underneath it. I want you to realize that when you have a hint of God's love, a hint of His peace, of His glory, of His moving, His manifest presence, that that is just the beginning. That's the 10% or whatever percent God decides because He's sovereign. That's the, a little glimpse of what God could do. He spoke stars into their place. He created us by molding and shaping us out of clay. You ever built anything out of clay? Have people been able to tell what it was you were building out of clay? <laughs> That's a nice dinosaur. It's a puppy dog. And yet he fashioned living, breathing people. And then he breathed his very own life into that clay. And it became a human being. Unbelievable. If you don't believe me, you've got to go online and look up the word lanolin. Uh, more science. It is the adhesion cell that keeps all of our cells together instead of, you know, Steve cells being on the floor here and on the chair and on the keyboard and on the... It keeps me together. These lanolin cells are the adhesion cells. Do you know what kind of shape they're in? A cross. Do you want to theologize about that? No, no, it's okay. Don't, but isn't God cool? It's a little hint. Get into a, micro, a microscope and, and look at Cells times, you know, what is it, 150,000 or something at a molecular level, and this adhesion cell is the shape of a cross. God's pretty cool. He does all things well. We see God, and the Word says He has shown us everything we need for life and godliness, 2 Peter 2, uh, 1, 2 and 3. But we also have these scriptures that explain that there is so much more to God than we will ever encounter. I'll put my hand over, and you can sense my glory, Okay. Uh, there, there's a cloud the size of a man's fist. There's these small moments where God does something, but he's so much more than that. Think about his goodness. The scripture says he knows how to give good gifts. If you've ever received a good gift. And in Luke, the same, same scripture, if you've ever received the Holy Spirit, that's God just showing a little bit of who he is. His presence, it says, is inescapable. If you read Psalm 139, I call it the unavoidable psalm. It talks about how he knit us together, how he is with us always, whether we make our, our bed in the depths of the sea or on the heights of the mountains or across the sea or whatever. He says, even there, you are with me. And light, dark is as light to you. So no matter where I find myself in light or darkness, your presence is there. So we get the sense that it's God's desire to show not just a hint of who he is, but completely who he is. In a lifetime of serving him, you will see God do things that you can't explain by human thinking, the scientific method. Let's talk about love for a second. First Corinthians, that wedding love. Did you know that the context of that wedding love is actually an outline of, of God and his bride, the church? We use it for our weddings, but actually that's secondary to the fact that God was explaining what love is. And of course, it ends saying that God is love and the greatest faith, hope, and love remain, but the greatest of these is love. And so God shows us that. And in fact, he does it by giving his son to die for our sins. In 1 John 4, 8, it says, perfect love casts out all fear. So if you're still feeling fear, 
it's okay because I sometimes feel fear too, okay? We're, we're learning. But if we still feel fear and perfect love casts out all fear, that means we are still learning to experience the fullness of God's love for us. We've only just begun. If we get it so that he begins to elevate us past our fear, it means that we trust God when we're perfect. We trust God when we're not perfect. We trust God when, when we have a solution, and we trust God when we don't have a solution. When we see miracles, we trust God, and when we don't see them, we need to trust God. And remember the times when he showed up and did what he did, that in times when we're still waiting for him to do that, we trust him, because this is actually who God is, the one who reveals himself. And he doesn't change ever. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If we don't feel that yet, all the time, then we're not fully understanding how God feels about us. It's a work in progress. What about power? He has the power to deliver a nation. I was reading this last week about how Israelites going up against these three different countries who want to do them in. Their armies are set. They're pulling together, and they're going to roll right over Israel. And he says, the prophet says, you are to go and prepare for battle and to stand. But know that today I will deliver them into your hands. I, the Lord will deliver them into your hands. So they suit up, they get the breastplate on there and the helmet and the, the shield, and they pull out their sword, they're ready for fighting, and they line up. You know what they see? And the field is strong with bodies everywhere, every one of them dead. It says, not one enemy escaped the deliverance of Israel. All three nations got nervous and started panicking and started fighting each other, and they destroyed each other. It says, not one of them escaped, and the Lord delivered Israel from their enemies. God can deliver you from your enemies. He showed us in that scripture. That's a whole nation. Now let's look at just one person. Simon Peter, the big mouth who started the early church. He says in Luke 22, Simon Peter, Satan has asked for you to destroy you, to sift you as wheat. And I love this. Jesus says, but I have prayed for you. And when you return, Encourage the saints. Encourage the brothers. And there's some discussion about translation where he says, um, Satan has asked for you that it was maybe in terms of all of you, like all the disciples. But the context is the one who is going to go away and then come back. And that was Peter who denied Christ three times. And then Jesus came back and restored him three times. He says, the devil has an assignment on you. He wants to take you out. Because he has this idea that you might have an anointing, that you might start the early church, that you might explain Pentecost and start praying or preaching about what it is to be a follower of Jesus, a Christian, a, a, a children or followers of the way. Satan was no dummy. If anyone was going to open their mouth about it, it would have been Peter. He had faith and he had the guts to be that front man to say, hey, God's doing stuff. And so the devil wanted to stop him before Jesus had even gone to the cross. The devil's not omniscient, but he ain't no dummy. And he was trying to take Peter out before he even began. That's why I believe there's a battle for this next generation to take them out before they ever do what God wants them to do. But the beautiful thing is, if God is for us, if God is for our children and our grandchildren, That took a turn. The power of God, even just a glimmer of it. If he shows up a little bit, that means he's real. If he's real, then he is who he says he is. All that power we see in the word of God becomes ours as his children. We have authority in Jesus' name. What? The authority of God. The promises of God that are yes and amen. We have those because if God has revealed himself at all, that means he is there just waiting to pour out more of his presence in your life and in mine. Whoo! Sorry, I do plan ahead and I talk it out and it doesn't affect me. And then the Holy Spirit uh, sneaks up on me. Yeah. Compassion. Imagine compassion. The shepherd leaves the 99, and he goes after the one. I saw a meme just this morning on Instagram about this one sheep, and there's dogs around, and there's shepherds around, and this one sheep is just freaking out, dancing around. And it's like the one that just came back from leaving the 99, and he's back with his brothers, and he's, woo! 
And I'm like, yeah, that's probably one of my sons. Or No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> probably me. Uh, only they would dance better than me. Uh, there's this joy of being found by God again, of, of him reaching out and going, yeah, that's where I need to be with him. And just recognizing, whew, it's still safe to come back. One of my, men, my mentors, Pastor Chuck, who we traveled to Cuba with, he, he ran away from the Lord when he was younger. He says, but you know, my dad was a preacher and he was preaching at night service because there was morning service and night service and midweek service and youth service and senior services and services and he and he intent meeting revivals and he'd go out and he'd do his own thing. He says, and every once in a while, he'd sneak back into the balcony and in worship or during prayer, he just needed to feel like he could feel God's presence again for a little bit. And he's like, okay, I haven't gone too far. And then he'd go out and be, a, you know, a, a jerk again, a goofy, you know, run after stuff. And then he'd go, oh man, I'm blowing it. And he'd sneak back into church again. Uh, he does not uh, invite people to, to play that kind of Russian roulette. He's like, you know what? Live for God, stick with God, trust God. And, and you will save yourself years of heartache and trying to come back to God. Uh, there's a reason why they call it backsliding, by the way. If you are in Christ, if you know God and you've been living for Him, and then you decide, yeah, I don't know, and kind of do your own thing. It is so much quicker to go from where you were with God to shoo, into nothingness. Or worse, into bondage and distraction from ever getting back with God. And then you have to walk back to that place where you're in tight with God again, feeling His presence, recognizing who He is. That's why I call it backsliding, because it's an uphill battle to restore that until Holy Spirit comes. But that compassion, He leaves the 99 and He seeks out the one. Holiness. We talk about grace a lot, but God reveals His holiness so pure and righteous and perfect. Isaiah falls on his face in the vision of him being in the throne room in, in the heavens in, in Isaiah 6. In fact, he says, woe of me because I'm a man of unclean lips from a people of unclean lips. And an angel comes to the altar with tongues, takes the live coal and touches his lips. He restores him. He heals him. It's an image of foreshadowing of what Christ came and did on the cross for us hundreds of years before. And then there's good plans. You've heard Jeremiah 29, 11. My plans aren't to harm you, but to prosper you, to bless you. And the, the other scriptures, 1 Corinthians 2, 9. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can conceive the good things that God has in store for those who love him. Good plans. So there's, there, I'm going to just go through a few because we're getting close. I, I see the time. Revealing, healing, sealing, and dealing. Revealing, healing, sealing, and dealing. First of all, revealing who he is. Is there a God? I mean, you can't get saved by God if you don't know God. He reveals himself, who he is, how he feels about us, life in a spiritual realm. You know, of the people I've led to the Lord, there's a, a good number of them, probably a third of them who've said, you know, I know, I know there's a Holy Spirit. I said, okay, how, how do you know that? He says, because I've met unclean spirits. I've seen spiritual stuff. It'll make your hair stand up in the back of your neck. So if there's that kind of bad darkness, garbage, I know there's got to be some light. I'm like, well, let me introduce you. His name is Jesus, right? But he reveals by his Holy Spirit. The Bible would seem like nonsense to you unless the Holy Spirit reveals to you that it's true. And then healing. You know, the biggest healing you're ever going to get when you come to Jesus is to heal your soul. Take you from death to life, from sin to salvation. He heals that part in us first and foremost, the most important thing. But also, he heals brokenness, physical, brokenness, emotional, brokenness, mental, and brokenness, especially spiritually. It's what he does. So he reveals and he heals. And then sealing, sealing the deal. In 1 Peter 1, he talks about our salvation being an inheritance which can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you and for me. Now, some people have clamped onto that and said, okay, eternal security doesn't matter what I do, I'm in. Well, the unpardonable sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit is to reject the work of Christ. There is a heaven and there is a hell. The thing is, hell is not full of people that God has rejected. Hell is full of people who have rejected God. I know it sounds like a, a bumper sticker. Go with me. Hell is not full of people that God rejected. Hell is full of people who have rejected God. 
It is not in his heart that any should perish. Good plans, revealing, healing, and sealing that inheritance. If you want salvation, it's there for you. It's free. Get a hold of it. It won't wash away. It doesn't have a, a, a best before date. Until Jesus comes, that's the best before date. When he comes in the clouds and brings up his bride at that point, you want to know <laughs> that you've received that gift. God seals that in us. He also covers us or seals us with the power of his blood. When we go through communion, he says, this is the new covenant in my blood. This is the new way you can relate to a holy and perfect God because on your own, you didn't have a chance. None of us had a chance except for the forgiving grace of Jesus Christ. Now he sealed us in a new covenant, a new relationship with God. And then dealing. Ha, he deals in restoration for us to God. And some of us think, how can I get to God? In fact, a lot of people go, that's it, I've gone too far. I can't, God will never take me now. Do you want God? Yes, but he just, he just can't. I love that part. Like, I, like, I like to say, hold on now. Are you God? Well, no, he's, he's God, yeah. And do you make up his mind or does he make up his own mind? Well, okay. And I watch this mental gymnastics. I think what I've done is so terrible. There's, there's guilt, there's shame. Sometimes there's condemnation. The scripture says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. There's conviction. Conviction is to say, hey, you can't be doing that. You need to change. Condemnation is, hey, you did that. You're an evil, dirty, rotten person. That's the devil. Okay. And so we carry that and, and people can understand that, that God is offering us something beautiful. As if you want it, you can have it. Dealing. He, so he doesn't only deal in restoration, he also deals in retaliating against the enemy. No weapon formed against you will prosper. That's the scripture says. It doesn't mean the devil will not try. He will continue to try and deceive and destroy, kill, steal, and destroy. That's his MO. But it also says we have authority. And so he will deal with the enemy that's trying to mess with us or our children or our children's children. So let's remember that when we pray, all right? Amen? When you pray, you devil's giving me a hard time, Lord. Get him. It's real. The other thing is dealing with reminding us about our identity in Christ. See, one of the reasons the devil gets as far as he does in our life sometimes, or even just the brokenness of humanity, how, how much it can take us down, is because we forget who we are in Christ. You are now a son or daughter of the Most High God. That's better than any rank, sergeant, captain, lieutenant, colonel, general, whatever, or, or any political, you know, prime minister, president, premier, chairman of the book club. It, none of that matters. You are now a child of the Most High God. If he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, that means you are spiritually royalty. Get the carpet, roll it out. We don't think like that. We don't, we don't think like that about ourselves because we need to walk humbly, but also to recognize who God says you are. That can make a big difference when you're trying to build up your self-esteem and, and, and recognize the parts of your identity that need restoring, that need healing. God offers those. So he deals in restoring, he deals in retaliating against the enemy, and he deals in reminding us about our identity in Christ. For those who are in Christ, we are a new creation. That's what the scripture says. All because of this, glint, uh, this glimmer, this hint of God's power operating in our lives. So he reveals, he heals, he seals, he deals. Why? Because of how he feels. I feel like Dr. Seuss right now. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm very impressed. It's because of how he feels. And you know this scripture. If you've ever watched golf, you've seen the sign or baseball. John 3, 16, you know it. For God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him, would not perish, but have everlasting life. Who's in the club? Whosoever. We're in the whosoever club. Jesus died for everybody. If you're from the South, all y'all, right? Every single person, Jesus died for them. It is his desire that every one of us would accept his free gift and see his power, see what he wants to do in us. The unfortunate part is not everyone sees that. But 
while it's still called today, the scripture says today's the day of salvation. Today's the day to let people know, hey, I can be forgiven. Today's the day to know that he who the Son sets free is free indeed. I can, I can have that? It's available right now? Yes, it is. And you don't have to wait four to six weeks till for delivery. You don't have to add, you know, 15% for sales tax. You don't have to wait for the UPS due to drop it off. Right now, Jesus offers complete forgiveness. He, he, he changes the nature of who you are. He, he creates something new in you. It's called, that's why we call it born again. And for those of you who have done that and been there, done that years ago, he still has new mercies every morning. He still has his manifest Holy Spirit presence in you. He's still the author of the joy of the Lord, which is our strength and the one who offers us peace beyond understanding and the one who loves and loves and loves and loves. And there's deeper places for us to go, church. And I want to be in those places. Can I get an amen? amen? Right? I'm not making this stuff up. This is God. For God so loves the world. I just kind of shorten it for a second. Take a look. For God so loved you. You know that repeating thing? It says, for God so loved me. Why don't you say it? For God so loved me. Now say it again. For God so loved me. That's the best news I've heard all day. When you realize what he's done for us, it's powerful. If you've seen even a little bit of God working in your life, you need to know how much more God is able to do. I'm, you don't have to believe it. I'll just keep saying it until you get it. If he's shown you anything at all about who he is, I'll tell you there's more that God wants to pour into your life. And it's not because I'm smart enough to know that. It's because I understand the Word of God is telling us that He will continue to transform us into His likeness. Every day, He will strengthen us. And you know, in our humanness, we've tried to see how, other, how far other things will take us. Money, career, fame, sex, drugs and rock and roll, homes, cars, fill in the blank. See, the devil will try to get us to pursue things that are, are not going to last or will satisfy, even though for a while they'll be enticing and promise some fulfillment. At the end, they'll be empty. What he's trying to do is suspend the reality long enough to know that when you finally get it, that this is not going to do it for me, it'll be too late. The devil will try and get us to pursue things that will not last or satisfy. Things that, he doesn't really care what the distraction is. Pick your, pick your poison. He doesn't care. What he cares about is that as long as it occupies us, our time, our resources, our thoughts, our, our finances, everything we pour into it, our commitment, our loyalty, and keeps us away from seeing just how far things can go if we just allow God to take us where he wants to take us, seeing what relationship could do to transform us. With money, let's just see if we can invest in the right places and make more money than we've ever made before. Let's get in a newer show house, like so House and Home will you know, feature us in the magazine, and, or, or I'll, have, I'll just have a corporation that's making so much money. You know, Sam Walton, who created Walmart, his, his wife, uh, after 17 stores, they were already millionaires, she said, Sam, when is it going to be enough for us to just stop and enjoy everything that we have accumulated in this life. You know what he said to her? It's never enough. She said, at that point, I knew I had lost him to his pursuit of this corporate image. I'm not sure if he realized it. He's not alive anymore. I'm sure he has now understood what's going on. The devil doesn't care what it takes as long as it keeps us from seeing how far God could take us. So why don't we just clear the slate? You need money to live. You need a home. You need a job. You need a relationship. But instead of living for those things, what if primarily we let God be first? Let's choose to make this faith journey our ultimate pursuit. See, immediately there are people who are going, challenging in their minds about what that might look like. Ultimate pursuit? Everything? Ah, you know, I don't know. That's the devil. He's nervous that you might stop putting all your energy into that other stuff and start really focusing on him, on him, God and what God might do with you. He's nervous. 
making our pursuit of God number one priority because after all, Jesus made you his ultimate pursuit, his ultimate passion, his ultimate purpose to bring glory to his Father up above. Let's see what God might do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know that you have more for me. Uh, I know you have more for every person within the sound of my voice right now. And I pray, Lord, that none of us would settle for anything else but your power and your presence, your love, that you want to continue to mold us and shape us in this room. And I just wonder if, if there's something that we know we need to put down so we can make our pursuit of God a priority. With our heads bowed, would you just say, you know what, there's something I'm going to let God take over and I'm laying this one thing or this however many things, I'm going to lay those down today and make God my ultimate pursuit. Would you just raise your hand and do that? I want to pray. Yeah. This stuff has been distracting me and holding me back from what God wants for me. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Yes. Right on. Hallelujah. Yes, that's it. God, you're more important because your relationship with us is, well, it's everything. Out of that, everything else flows. Out of that, you can bless us with money or bless us with a home or, or just take care of Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, all that stuff, that will be added unto you. He's talking about removing our anxiety or fear that, that we're going to be able to take care of. God, you will take care of your children. And I pray, Lord, right now that you would just make that profound move or shift in our minds. We've got to pursue you first and foremost, and then everything else, it will fall into place. Because that's what your word says over us. So those things we've just said, Lord, I'm going to lay those down and put them in the right perspective again right now as I'm coming after you. I pursue you right now. I'm coming after you right now. I want more of you right now. Holy Spirit, begin to just minister to those people right now that they would have a manifest presence, a hint of your reality just resting on them right now. I love you. I have a plan for you. Let me, let me take your hand and show you what you have yet to see. I want to reveal myself to you right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness today. Do that work in us. And help us not leave this place and forget all about it. We'll continue to put you first, God. And the first time the devil wants to throw that thing back up in our face to take hold of it, to, to grab our attention, to take us down the, 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 the garden path, Lord, right, right then, give us the fortitude. Say, I'm, I'm seeking, seeking Christ first. God, do that work in me. Do that work in all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's all stand. Hallelujah. Let this last song be a prayer that, Lord, we want the full plan that you have for us, Lord God. Lord, we are not satisfied with our commitment right now, Lord. We want to do more for you, Lord. We want to give you our heart, everything that we are. And we pray, Father, that you will take away whatever is in the way, Lord. Be it pride, Lord. Be it distractions. Be it the motives of our heart, Lord God. Take everything away that is in the way of us realizing what your plan is for our lives, Lord God. And this church is, we're just seeing just a hint, like Pastor said. We are just seeing a glimmer of what God can actually do. And so, Lord, we just want it. We want it, Lord God. We want your full plan for us. We want your will, oh God. Not our will be done, but your will be done in our lives, Lord. And so we just want to lift up our surrender to you, Lord. We just commit everything to you, Lord God. And if our hearts have gone cold, then we want to surrender our hearts to you right now. And Father, we pray that you will ignite us, Lord God. Burn in us, Lord, so that we can just use this passion, Lord, for whatever your will is for us, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. you Lord God hear the cry of our hearts today Lord a cry of surrender to you Lord 
if my heart has grown cold, there your love will unfold. As you open my eyes to the work of your hand, when I'm blind to my way, there your spirit will pray. As you open from this place with your blessing release us in this place with your will and with your power that comes from your spirit we thank you lord for all that you have done and for all that you are going to do in each and every one of our lives today lord hallelujah we give you praise and honor in your mighty name we pray amen amen hallelujah thank you lord god thank you Jesus.